Over 15,000 near-Earth asteroids are currently known to be orbiting the Sun. Near-Earth asteroids are commonly classified into families based on the shapes and sizes of their orbits. Few near-Earth asteroids survive in their orbits for more than a few million years, as many collide with planets or the Sun, or are gravitationally ejected from the solar system. Ability to detect and predict the orbital paths of near-Earth asteroids has accelerated within the past few decades, raising the question of how likely a potential collision with one of these asteroids may be, and what it might be possible for us to do to avoid or lessen the damage due to such a collision. The asteroid belt was formed early in the solar system's evolution between Mars and Jupiter, where some scientists believe a small planet originally orbited that was then gravitationally destructed by the pull of Mars and Jupiter. Over time, many asteroids were consumed by Jupiter or gravitationally ejected from the solar system, leaving the total mass of the asteroid belt at less than 5% that of the Moon. Most near-Earth asteroids are asteroids that were ejected from the main asteroid belt due to gravitational interactions with Jupiter, while some are extinct comets caught in smaller orbits around the Sun. The formation of the solar system as is pertinent to its geologic bodies may also be tested in this event, primarily focusing on the distribution of different substances around the Sun during the condensation of the protoplanetary disk, the large cloud of dust that condensed around the Sun early in its formation. This describes the most popular um, of solar system formation theories and is known as the nebular hypothesis. Part 2 of the 2018 solar system event tests students' knowledge of the history and observation of physical and geological processes through both qualitative and quantitative understandings. This part of the exam may include calculations, questions involving real data, as well as diagrams and maps. Questions that fall under this section of the rules may be paired with questions from Part 1. Students may be asked questions about remote sensing and imagery as related to measuring and observing the objects in Part 1, especially their geologic features. Exams may test students' understanding of why specific wavelengths or specific types of measurements are used for different objects, as well as the roles that object mass, surface, atmosphere, or location play in determining our ability and strategy in studying these objects. Tests may include questions about different kinds of telescopes and instrumentation, including Earth-based or Earth-orbiting observatories, as well as missions to the objects themselves. Example types of remote sensing that could be asked about are radar altimetry, spectroscopy, imaging in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, and gravity sensing. Exams may include questions on specific past, present, or future missions to study the objects included in Part 1. Students should be familiar with how and when important discoveries about these objects were made and understand the origin of the measurements and imagery of these objects. The focus on future missions to study these objects should include an understanding of what kinds of questions future missions will be able to answer and how they will answer them. Students are expected to have both a quant quantitative and qualitative understanding of Kepler's laws of planetary motion and should be able to recognize these laws in words, equations, or pictorial form, as well as perform calculations using real data. Kepler's first law. The orbit of a planet is an ellipse with the sun at one of the two foci. Students are not required to be familiar with the complete geometry of an ellipse, but should understand the basic principles of its construction and the relationship between perihelion, the distance of closest approach to an object, aphelion, the distance of further, furthest approach to an object, semi-major axis, the average of perihelion and aphelion distance, and eccentricity, the variance of an orbit from circular. Kepler's second law, or the law of equal areas. A line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. Kepler's third law. The square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. This may be expressed as p squared equals a cubed. Students should be comfortable using this relation with units of astronomical units for distance and years for period for objects orbiting the Sun, but need not be familiar with the role that mass plays for using Kepler's third law in systems outside our own solar system. Exams may include questions about tides, specifically regarding the Earth-Moon system. Tides are caused by changes in the relative positions of the Moon and Earth 
and the gravitational bulges created by the moon's gravitational tug on Earth. Students should understand why different parts of the world experience different tidal patterns at different times of day. Students should be familiar with neap tides and spring tides, which occur when the gravitational forces due to the sun and the moon are perpendicular and parallel, respectively. Students should understand and be able to identify eclipses, both from diagrams of the sun, moon, and earth, and as observed from earth. Solar eclipses occur when the moon passes in front of the sun as viewed from earth, blocking all but the outermost regions. Total solar eclipses occur when the entire face, or photosphere, of the sun is blocked, whereas annular solar eclipses occur when the moon is further from earth and its projection does not fully eclipse the sun. Lunar eclipses occur when the Earth completely blocks the Sun from illuminating the Moon, allowing only the outermost light from the Sun to shine red on the face of the Moon when it is refracted around Earth. Students should be familiar with lunar libration, or the slight variations in the hemisphere of the Moon that is visible to Earth. Questions may cover longitudinal libration, latitudinal libration, as well as diurnal libration, and what causes each of them. Longitudinal libration is caused by lagging of the moon's position relative to Earth due to the moon's eccentric orbit. Latitudinal libration is caused by the slight tilt of the moon's orbital axis relative to Earth's and the variation of the relative tilt angle between the two bodies. Diurnal libration is caused by the motion of observers along the surface of the Earth as the Earth rotates, meaning observers experience a different view of the moon as they move relative to Earth's center. The phases of the moon and what causes them are also included in part two. The lunar cycle and the relationship between the phase of the moon and what time the moon rises and sets each day may also be tested. For example, this diagram shows a full moon among other phases. Students can infer based on the position of the sun, moon, and earth that a full moon rises in the evening, reaches its highest point in the sky at midnight, and sets in the morning. Regolith is a general name for the fine material that makes up the surfaces of geologic bodies in the solar system. Students should be familiar with processes like weathering and cratering that generate regolith on the surface of these bodies, as well as the composition of regolith, including whether or not it varies across the surface of the object and how scientists determine its composition. Cratering is one of the most significant processes in the solar system with regards to shaping the surfaces of rocky bodies. The size and age of different craters can inform scientists about when and where significant cratering events, such as the late heavy bombardment, occurred in the history of the solar system. Lack of craters, such as the surface of Io exhibits, can inform scientists as to how fast new surface material is being generated. Volcanism and weathering are two important geologic processes that shape and recycle the surfaces of geologic bodies in the solar system. Volcanism on Venus, Mars, and Io may be compared and contrasted. Whether from atmospheric dynamics or fluid flows on the surfaces of the objects specified in Part 1 may also be included. The atmospheres of the objects included in Part 1 of this event are important both in contributing to the surface characteristics of the objects and in determining how scientists can study them. Different atmospheric compositions, temperatures, and dynamics determine which wavelengths of light and what methods of remote sensing can be used to study the surfaces of different objects. Dating the surface of geologic bodies of the solar system is essential to understanding the history of these bodies and determining the frequency, intensity, and nature of the internal and external features that have contributed to the geologic evolution of the surfaces of these bodies. Radioactive dating allows scientists to determine how much of specific isotopes remain in the surface features of these bodies, which may have been present in the atmospheres or surfaces of these objects in different quantities in the past compared to the present. Radioactive dating uses the formula shown, where A represents the current concentration of an isotope. A0 represents the concentration of the isotope present a number of years ago. T represents the age of the feature and H is a constant, or the half-life, of that isotope that indicates how long it takes for one half of the total atoms of an isotope present to decay. Students do not need to understand the origin of this formula, but should be familiar with the idea of isotopes, versions of atoms with different numbers of neutrons, and radioactivity, the decay of these atoms into other atoms over time. 
The example exam, along with an annotated version, will be posted on the Solar System Division B page on the National Science Olympiad event website. The annotated version of the exam can be used by coaches and event supervisors to understand the kinds of questions and test formats that are most appropriate for this exam, as well as the appropriate length and difficulty for a typical solar system exam. Students can take the unannotated version of the exam in preparation for competition this season. A number of helpful resource websites for Solar System 2018 are included at the bottom of the rule sheet for this event. These include the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory Planetary Geophysics website, the NASA Planets website, the NASA Moon website, the NASA Asteroids website, as well as the NASA Space Place Eclipse website. The National Event Supervisor for Solar System is Dr. Dustin Schroeder, an Assistant Professor of Geophysics at Stanford University in California. Follow the suggestions provided here to prepare for competition. If you have any questions, please submit them online for, to the Rules Clarification website if they involve the event description. Event supervisors are not allowed to answer any individual questions about the event, as this would be unfair to others. Enjoy this event and have a great season!